Πριν ακούσετε το επεισόδιο που ακολουθεί με την πρόξενο των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών στη Θεσσαλονίκη, την Ελίζαμπετ Κέιλι, το οποίο είμαι σίγουρη ότι θα το απολαύσετε όπως το απόλαυσα και εγώ όταν το ηχογραφούσαμε, ήθελα να σας ευχηθώ καλές γιορτές, να περάσετε όσο γίνεται καλύτερα δεδομένες της συγκυρίας. Επίσης, ξέρω πολύ καλά ότι είστε αρκετοί εκεί πέρα έξω οι οποίοι οι γιορτές είναι μία άσχημη περίοδος, δεν είναι δεδομένο ότι για όλους είναι μία χαρούμενη περίοδος. Έχω να σας πω το πολύ απλό ότι είναι μία εβδομάδα και θα περάσει. Σας βλέπω, σας νιώθω. Στους ανθρώπους που νιώθετε, μονα... που νιώθετε μοναξιά κατά τη, διά... κατά τη διάρκεια των γιορτών, στους ανθρώπους που αντιμετωπίζετε και παλεύετε με κάποια ασθένεια ή πνευματική ασθένεια, σε αυτούς που φροντίζετε ανθρώπους που δεν είναι καλά, σε αυτούς που... Οι γιορτέ είναι ένα αγώνα, ακόμα και σε αυτού που οι γιορτέ, τα οικογενειακά τραπέζια δεν είναι και το πιο ευχάριστο, να το πω έτσι πολύ απλά. Θα περάσει, παιδιά. Εύχομαι αυτό. Καλέ γιορτέ, να περάσει όσο γίνεται πιο όμορφα για όλου μα. Το podcast που ακολουθεί είναι με την Elizabeth Kaylee και μιλάμε για πάρα πολλά πράγματα. Θα σα αρέσει πολύ. Είχα σκοπό να κάνω μετάφραση την ώρα τη εκπομπή, αλλά τελικά δεν ήθελα να κόβω τη ροή. Ίσως αργότερα βγει με κάποια διαστήματα τα οποία θα μεταφράζω κάποια περίληψη. Το σκέφτομαι δηλαδή να ξέρετε. Αυτά από μένα απολαύσετε την Ελίζα Μπεθκέλη, γενική πρόξενο των Ηνωμένων Πολιτειών στη Θεσσαλονίκη, να μιλάει για το πώς είναι η ζωή μιας διπλωμάτης σας, γιατί κάνει αυτή τη δουλειά, για τη δύναμη της αφήγησης και για πάρα πολλά άλλα θα σας αρέσει πάρα πολύ. Θα σας ξετρελαθείτε. Σας αγαπάω πάρα πολύ. Φιλιά πολλά. Today with me is Elizabeth Kaylee. Good morning, Elizabeth. Good morning. So it's Elizabeth. Yeah, so you can oh. call me Elizabeth or Elizabeth, as you wish. <laughs> okay. The Elizabeth Kaylee is a general proxy of the United States in Thessaloniki. She is the Consul General of the United States of America in Thessaloniki. Welcome to the show, Elizabeth. Thank you so much, Despina, for having me here today. How long have you been in Thessaloniki? Α, oh, δεν ξέρω ακριβώ, αλλά νομίζω ότι ήμουν εδώ 14 μήνε, ίσω. Ναι. Ναι, ναι. Ναι. Mm-hmm. So you take classes of, of Greek classes with, with a teacher, I can imagine. I do, but you know the best teacher is the street. <laughs> of course, of course, of course, so, of course. Yeah, so I, yes. try, to, I try to practice uh, when, I, when I go out. Um, to buy like a colori or a coffee or whatnot. But that means that my uh, my vocabulary regarding Greek food is very good and unfortunately not much else. So that's where we're at right <laughs> okay. now. Before we start, in, in August, I bumped into, into a beautiful TED Talk of Taya Selassie, who is, um, who is telling that the question, where are you from, can be very limiting nowadays and with the lives we, we all we all lead. And she suggests that a, a more convenient and relevant question would be, where are you local? Because where are you local tells a very different story. It tells about your relationships that you had with the city. Mm-hmm. It tells about the rituals that you may follow when you are in a city. And it tells the restriction as well. So I am local to Thessaloniki. Athens and in Barcelona. Where are you local? Okay, that's interesting. It's a very interesting uh, reframing, I think, of an uh, age old question. I mean, it's one of the first things you, at least for me, I learned in Greek, yeah, apple puise. But, uh, and I, I always say I'm from California, uh, which is partially true, but I do think that that question does kind of uh, conceal the complexities of our, our modern day existence. Um, so if someone were to ask me, and I kind of want to re- return to that question because from a philosophical standpoint, it's very interesting. Um, but if someone were to ask me, where are you local? I would have to also frame it in terms of temporality. So I'm here right now, Thessaloniki. So I would say I'm local to Thessaloniki. Um, but I do think that it's important to also provide context So I know you added like several cities, but I would add like, you know, I would change the question to be like, where are you local and where are you connected to? 
Yeah. Um, and so I would say I'm connected to all the places that I've lived for work, like uh, Jerusalem, Seoul, New York City, Baghdad. Um, but uh, but also I'd have to have California because that's where I grew up. So that's how I would answer that question, I think. Where did you grow up? I grew up in so I, I grew up in San Francisco. Okay. Um, because my parents immigrated there um, when uh, before I was born, um, and uh, and I guess that's where my origin story starts is, is with my parents who immigrated there, um, and I uh, I lived there for a little while, and then I moved to Southern California which I don't know whether you're familiar with the dichotomy between Northern and Southern California, but it's very much kind of like Boria, Elada, and like Athena, you know? Paco Lubiacos, yeah, Barcelona, no, 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 Madrid, no, 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 and then all no, this no, stuff. Exactly, okay. yes, exactly. Like, yeah, the Calamaki, Sublaki, like all that yeah. stuff. Right? <laughs> I didn't know that, that that's plus plus for California as well. It is. I mean, it's less of a... It's. I, I think that it, it's, it's more kind of friendly kind of ribbing like yeah. from Northern California, Southern California. But it does actually my accent that you hear um is actually a Southern California accent. Oh. Yes. In case your listeners were not familiar, this is what a Southern California girl sounds like. Um but uh but yeah but the the I guess the 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 feeling is different. And I think that uh but the the thing that both cities share are both I guess regions share that it's very similar to Thessaloniki is the sense of halara, <laughs> which is really it's something that is very unique. The Southern the... California, you mean? It's no, halara. no, no, for both. Okay, yeah, for like, it's a California thing. Yes, halara, right? We've seen that on the movies and and the TV series. That's it's different than New York. It's very different than New York. So actually, my personality is much more New York. Oh, but just because I. I lived there for a while, and like I um, and I, I lived in the I worked in the East Coast for a long time, also in Washington D.C. So I, I just that's kind of more aligned with also my type of work that mm -hmm. I do as a diplomat. But my personality is is very California. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like I, I, my the way I come across, I love surfing. I love Mexican, like all of the things. Tanning. Yes, that too. <laughs> yes, definitely that. But okay. What were you as a little girl? Do you, because I'm obsessed with, with the question, why someone does the job that he does? It, was it something in, in, in your infancy or was it something that could predict your work or it was nobody could tell that you, that you would do that as a diplomat? That's an interesting question. Um, you know, I've, I've answered this question before um, in, in different interviews that I've done. I will answer it in some ways with the same roots, but I'm going to expand a bit. So it does have to start with my parents because my parents, um, they, when my father was, how old was he? I think he must have been about, he was about 10 and my mother was uh, maybe three mm -hmm. or so. And... Um, And then the, the Korean War happened. Okay. Um, and it really, really, um, I mean, it destroyed, like, the, the country, like South Korea, but it really uprooted their lives. And um, my mother and, and my grandparents, um, they had to flee mm -hmm. to Pusan, which is okay. 200 miles south. And then um, and they lived in a laundromat for three years. And I remember my mother telling me this story where, and they were well-to-do. And so this was like what the wealthy people did is they lived with six other families in laundromats. And so my mother lived on like, she slept on a ironing board and she was tiny because she was becoming malnourished, right? So she was able to fit there. And then she remember, I remember her telling me a story of how she fell off the ironing board one night. She hit her head and then they rushed her to the hospital and they weren't sure whether she was going to live or die. And she still has this, back of her head is flat and it's from like falling on okay. from that ironing board which is a very visceral reminder of of this time in her life and then like and then on my on my father's side he lost his i don't know whether he lost his father but he never heard from his father again his father disappeared 
Okay. So he was either kidnapped by the North Koreans or he was killed, right? So it's very traumatic what they both went through. Mm-hmm. And they never talk about it, mm-hmm. like ever. Um, and it's just something that they they glance over. Oh, yeah, yeah, when that happened. Oh, yeah, yeah, remember when my your cousin disappeared and he, like, we don't know what happened to him. Oh, yeah, I remember that. I mean, it's really, like, the way they talk about casual trauma, it's really, like, it's, it's something I'm not used to. But it's something that... Um, that is really, um, that impacted me because I always grew up with the sense that life is tenuous and that it's important, it's life is tenuous. We can't take all of this prosperity that I had growing up as a middle class American in California for mm-hmm. granted. It can be taken away. And this is something that is different, I think, than a lot of my American, like, classmates growing up, many who are, like, second, third, fourth generation. Mm -hmm. For me, it was very, like, you know. And the other thing was that for them, both my parents were, like, um, they were so grateful to the United States. They've always been grateful to the United States for, like, intervening um, and for helping, like, the country. Um when it did and so that was something like that they always imparted in me um and they were like america is the greatest country on earth and um and i always felt like i had a debt to pay to the united states it was a blood debt it was a life debt i mean i know that sounds very dramatic but i I, no not at all not at all i I can understand yes and then so i was like you know the united states has done so much for me and you know i'm we we can talk more about this but i'm also i'm gay i'm a lesbian and then every time i went back in the summertime with my my mother um and i would feel like how I mean, not that in the U.S. it was better, like, necessarily at that time, but I didn't feel like I was in danger. And, like, the sense of, like, when I was in in Seoul, I was like, it would be really, really difficult for me to be openly lesbian here um, because it's so traditional. And then so for me, I I always felt like um, the openness of the United States um, was, it was just something that I was always just really, like, not only I admired and embraced as an American, but something I thought was really important to share with people. Um, so for all these reasons, I think that, again, like just this awareness that life can be very hard, um, but also the sense of gratitude to the United States and the this desire to give back because I felt like I owed the United States um, and my family owed the United States. But then also that, you know, everything the United States shared with me and my family, I could also share with other people. Um, I think that that there's all kind of like this need for meaning, this need for like, um, again, like for kind of giving back, kind of really paved the way for me, a fertile ground for me to do something like I think in... I wouldn't go so far as, I mean, the international affairs certainly, like, it led to that, but I needed to do something that, um, again, like, provided not only meaning for myself, but meanings but, for others. Yeah. yeah. So, and you decided to study international studies. No, I didn't study international studies. I actually, you know, I'll be very honest. I kind of, like, I wouldn't say fumbled. Fumbled is too, sounds, there was more intentionality, but it was after 9-11, And I was a law student, Um, and I was interested in going into public interest law, like maybe becoming a public defender or something like that. And um, and so I remember, like, the day that that happened, I was like, I think it was the beginning of my second year in law school, and I was walking, like, across a bridge. My roommate was walking towards me. We didn't have, like, you know, I don't know, we, we... we still had, like, he had a boom box. I was like, what is he doing, right? I was like, and he carried this box, but it wasn't playing music, it was the radio. And I was like, what just, what's going on, Brandon? And he was like, the Twin Towers just fell. You were in New York then? No, I was in Minnesota. Okay. I had just left New York. And, um, and, uh, and then I just, it totally just, I, I didn't understand, but then we were all, like, I remember all of us were gathered, the law students were gathered in like a small room, we're watching television, we watched the second tower, 
first tower to fall and watch the second tower fall, and then together. And then most of my classmates were thinking of going into private law. I think a, a lot of them ended up going into, um, they became uh, military attorneys, or they joined the military outright, not even as attorneys. And for me, like, I wanted to do something, but at the time, don't, don't ask, don't tell was an effect. And for me, I thought it made more sense as a lesbian um, yeah. to work someplace where I could be more open with my identity. Of course, it's not, you know, it's changed now, the military. But um, so that's why I was starting to look at the State Department. And so I, uh, I took the test twice. I failed twice. Okay. Um, and it was a very difficult test. And then, um, and then I passed the third time. And, but again, I didn't think, oh, I want to do this or that. I, I want to serve in Thessaloniki one day. I don't think I even knew, like, how to pronounce Thessaloniki at the time. Like, it's just that there was an aggregation of experiences, an aggregation of, of, of meaningful experiences and, um, and doors that opened up that kind of led me down, down, I think, a path that, that made sense. And each step I took, because even when I started, I was like, what is, I didn't have any diplomats in my family. I was like, what is this? Yeah. Each step I took, I became more and more sure that this was the right path for me. It's like there's a Spanish phrase that se hace camino al andar. As the path opens by walking, there's no yeah. other way. Acrebos. It's exactly what happened, yes. Yeah. And, um, and the more, and not only that, I became very conscious as I was walking this path. This path I'm walking is a path that I'm not only walking for myself, but for everyone who's coming behind me. So I need to make sure that I am yeah. as transparent as possible of walking this path. You're a trailblazer. And that's that's how, that's how we met. I mean, I met you during the tech camp that is an initiative of the U.S. Embassy on all over the world than the one that happened in Thessaloniki. And on your closing remarks, you shared with 40 other women from the Balkan area about a story that I would like you to share with me, with my audience about the, um, what it, it entails for women to, to become diplomats. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I just want to caveat that that, <laughs> that anecdote was not planned But it did come from... We um, could tell. <laughs> uh, yes, I, I was. I hope you can tell because it was so, you know, But everyone was so emotional. I mean, not only you, everyone. We were so emotional. Yes. I mean, I think it was... This is what happened. I came in, I was sitting down, and then I, I heard what was, say, what was being said, and I was like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I cannot give these scripted <laughs> remarks. Because it was going to be like, it was like, this does not... Out, out of the tone that they... they no, <laughs> no. People were like, I could tell they were talking from their hearts, right? Yeah. And I was like, if I don't speak from my heart, no one's going to hear me. And also it's dishonoring you. Yes, because exactly. Because, yeah, you're there and you're like being open. I need to do that too. That's how I felt. I mean, in a second. It's not like it was conscious. It was just like, I just knew. You caught the... The zeitgeist, Yes. yes? And then so I was like, okay. So I um, I put aside these very well written remarks that my <laughs> colleague had drafted, and I was like, okay, we need something else. And I decided to share a story that I had only recently discovered, and this is a story be, um, based that I found based on research that I conducted when I was at Princeton. Uh, I did a fellowship at Princeton in 2018, and. Um, One of the projects that I did was I interviewed 19 women ambassadors uh, from the United States about their experiences as women leaders, the challenges they faced, the opportunities, but mostly the challenges, okay. right? Um, and the some of them, you know, I think, um, I mean, the, the age range was quite vast, but I heard all of these amazing life stories, things that, you know... I can't imagine like going through myself like right now. And, um, and I've gone through a fair amount, I think. And then, so, um, but one of the stories that someone shared with me and, uh, and that I was reading about separately, like in his, in kind of, a books about the history of the foreign service after was that, um, women in the foreign service were not allowed to actually join the foreign service until the 1920s. 
And at that time, Amazing. and they made it as difficult as possible at the time, not only for women, but also for, for other minority groups as well, for recently naturalized citizens, for African-Americans, for anyone who didn't fit or comport with the stereotype at the time of what an American diplomat looked like. A white male straight man. Yes. I mean, the straight was just a given, <laughs> yes, right? Okay. But, but and someone who graduated from... I know, I mean, Yale, Harvard. Ivy League, yes, yeah. yes, exactly. Like when, uh, and and so you were a product of like um, not only an institution, but uh, of a certain system, shall we say? Yes? yes. And not to say these were not good officers, but but it definitely it was an exclusive club, and they called it the Pretty Good Club, right? Yeah, a limited table. Yes, yes, and um, and then so the. There were a very, very small number of women who like joined the foreign service until, um, I mean, even after the doors were quote unquote opened and, um, and even by 1970, uh, only 5% of all foreign service officers were women. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, that's 5%. 5% of all foreign service officers. And in the United States of America. In the U.S. Imagine yes. other countries. I, I don't, yeah. Yes, I, but... Uh, yes, yes. And then so 5%. And not only that, and this is the story that I, I, I wanted to share that someone had, uh, one of the ambassadors shared with me, is that um, when one of these ambassadors was, um, when she um, bec- when she got married, uh, there was a, a rule at the time that if you're a woman and you're a foreign service officer and you got married... Then you had to resign from the Foreign Service. And this is this was from the 1970s until like the mid... Uh, I mean, it, it lasted through the mid-70s, but it had been, it had been in effect for a while. So when she... People discovered she was going to get married. She got called into an administrative office and she was asked, Congratulations, Miss X, on your upcoming marriage. When can we expect your resignation? Oh, wow. Oh, and, my God. Um, and then she... She just looked at this woman who was asking her this question and she said, I want to know, like, where are the regulations that tell me I have to resign? Show me those. No one had ever asked this question before. I can't believe that. Yes. No one had asked this question before. And this woman across like from her was flummoxed. She was like, well, uh, you know, and she couldn't answer. And it turns out there were no regulations. There were no rules in place. It was just a matter of custom. Yes. And then so that custom, after this incident happened, like eventually went away um, and was eliminated altogether. But um, the point of my story was that it took one person. Yeah, it took one person. To ask why. And from that why... She like could she opened this like door for all of these other women for the women behind her for behind her yeah and so and this I mean this illustrates the importance of not just saying yes not necessarily saying no but having the courage to ask why yeah why and, not yes <laughs> exactly yeah yeah so you're why not as well yes yeah. yeah. So I think that um, Yati and Yati Ohi and, you know, and then Ohi, actually, in this yeah. case. And then she came out, became an ambassador later on. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, it's a really... And then now, I'm proud to say, we have, like, it's not still exactly where you'd like it to be, but we're at 30-plus percent of our ambassadors now are women, and we're almost at 50-50 percent yeah. for uh, in terms of the number of foreign service officers uh, who are gender parity. So we've come such a long way. Yeah. But again, like, and this illustrates my point is like, and I'm very flattered that you call me a trailblazer, but I don't <laughs> see myself that way. I really see myself in like, in making sure that I definitely like walking in well-trod footsteps, but I just want to walk one or two more steps in front of me so that someone else can come behind. And maybe I think that is, that's the most I have much more humble, like, kind of aspirations. I, I think that that's the most you can do and try to hold the door open for as many people exactly. as possible. And, and what's the, the phrase that you you send the elevator back 
on, Send the on, elevator back down. That's right. Yeah. 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 Like, but you're setting an example that's, and we cannot be what we cannot see. So there are little girls that they can see that a woman can be a counsel. Yes. I mean, I, it's I, not given. I mean, no, no, it's not a given. And this is something that I really have been very conscious about. I mean, we have, I think that I, you know, I, I fit, I guess I have a lot. I, I think I have the more than the, the sum total of these, I guess, categories, perhaps that I could fall into our identities. Like I'm a woman. I'm Asian. I'm Korean American. I'm Asian American. I'm, uh, I'm short. <laughs> um, relatively speaking, I'm, uh, I'm a lesbian. Um, I'm from California. Like, what do these things all mean? I mean, it's part of who you are. They're part of who I am, but they're not who I am at the same exactly. time. Exactly. Right. There's agency. Um, but what I, the thing I really want to make clear, not just for little girls, but for anyone is that any one of those, or even a combination of those, does not is not a permanent obstacle and it's your perceived limitations do not define your ability to be successful oh i love that stop right there stop right there stop right there one more okay. time one more time your your perceived limitations how do you say it your perceived limitations yeah. do not limit your ability to be successful And I want to say perceived because we think of something as, oh, yeah, this is an obstacle. I'm like, you think it's an obstacle. You think it's a limitation. But who knows? Even like the biggest roadblock could actually be a stepping stone towards your success at the yeah. end of the day. Even if it's the most painful lesson that you learn from it, yeah. and it could be the foundation for that next level. And, and I have the feeling that the, the greatest challenge for us women and minorities is to unlearn to unlearn stuff, to unlearn our beliefs in order to do what we want to do. Yes. I, I think it's, there's a lot of unlearning and I think, well, let me, I don't know. I would love to get your thoughts on this. I mean, I think there is unlearning, but it's in tandem with unfearing. And because a lot of the unlearning has to do with what you fear. Yes. And so, I mean, I think that, you know, you can say a lot of things here, feel the fear and do it anyway. I would add that, you know, do it anyway, because everything you want is on the other side of that fear. Okay. Right? There's, on, there's that. But there's also like, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that there's the more, there's so much power to be gained Because fear is energy, too. Yeah. There's so much power to be gained every time you overcome or work through one of those fears. It's very it's very powerful. And then that fear becomes your friend. Yes. Um, and, and then you also... The most powerful thing, though, is learning what actually needs to be feared and what was just something you thought. Yeah. Because then it goes back to that perception. Yeah. Yeah. Then you realize a lot of the things that I think are important... Maybe are not that important. A lot of the things that I think are to be feared maybe aren't that, you know, scary after all. But you have to walk like on the precipice to see it. Yeah. So let's go to your to your job. What yes. what does a consul do? Ah. Well, as a consul general here, I am the the head of the uh, the consulate general uh, here in Thessaloniki which means I am the representative uh, for the United States here in, in Thessaloniki in Northern Greece. Um, we're thinking, I think that's about 300,000, um, it's more than that, actually. Uh, three million people, is that right? Like um, Yeah, the broader area. Yeah, the broader region yes. has three, uh, three million people. Um, so that's an awesome responsibility. Uh, what I see the consulate as is, and I don't know how familiar your, your, read, uh, your listeners, excuse me, are with uh, embassies and the function of embassies, but just really like, um, you know, to kind of, I guess, distill it in very few words, an embassy, a consulate, they're here to represent like the national interests of the United States and promote bilateral ties between like the host nation here, in this case, Greece, 
and the United States. And this can be on a, a this is, is on a spectrum of like a broad spectrum of different areas. There's politics, economics, like economics includes investment, trade and investment, for instance, um, energy issues here in, in Greece, uh, cultural issues, education. It's really, really broad and very yeah. rich. Every day is different. Every day is different. For me, it's a, I'm a microcosm, and I also work very closely with my embassy contacts, um, uh, contacts colleagues, uh, very closely. Um, and we, um, and h- here in northern Greece, um, we are trying to focus on all of these different things, um, but more tailored towards northern Greece and and even northern Greece. Though it's like uh, the more I'm here. The more I, I discover and learn how diverse even Northern Greece is. Yes, you that know? is true. It's so diverse. Like going to Thraki is like a different world than going to Diviki Macedonia. I know. For I'm telling my, my, my foreign friends and they, and they cannot understand that Greece yeah. is very, very different. Yeah. No, it's, it's extremely, extremely different. I mean, it's and especially in the north. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's there's like this, you know, we talk about microclimates. I'm talking about microcultures even. Yes, that is true. And you have to, for me, it's not like I'm an expert. I go maybe two, three days to each of these places, but I try, I can feel it. It's like, this is a very, very different place with different interests, different economic interests, different cultural interests, different histories. Yeah. um, A different sense of place. Um, Yes. And so it's something that, um, I think is really important for me as a diplomat to be aware of as I'm like um, interacting with with people here in Northern Greece. And, you know, I think there was a show like, I don't know, how long ago was it? I don't know. It was maybe 20, 30 years ago. Uh, yeah. And then I think sometimes in Northern Greece. How do you know that? I mean. Is that true? <laughs> yes. Okay. I, I just want to make sure. I was yes, like, is that right? True. Yes, I Okay. Mean. But then I think sometimes even in Northern Greece, like we have to be careful that, you know, Exactly. You know? And so each of these places are lo- localities, as you said, like as we started with this conversation. So it's something, it's something that um, I think is really important uh, to recognize. Which city was the most challenging for you? You mean in my career? Yes. Uh, I think when I was in Baghdad. In Baghdad, yeah. Probably. Um, that was, it was 2013 to 2014. Everything I know about Baghdad is from the TV show. Which one? There's... The one, the one who, who she has a bipolar. Oh, yes. That's uh, it. Homeland. Homeland, yes. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I actually I haven't seen Homeland in such a long time, but um, great show. Yes. Um, but uh, How was Baghdad? You know, I was there during uh, a challenging time, not only for myself, but also for my colleagues. Uh, it was, I was there from the summer 2013 to summer 2014. And the, you know, when I arrived, um, Al-Qaeda in Iraq was still Al-Qaeda in Iraq. Yeah. And then a few months later, we're like, oh, they, they, they've changed their name. I'm like, oh, what is it? It's like, oh, they're calling themselves like Islamic State now. I was like, oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then the situation worsened. And then finally, like, you know, it ended with in, in June of 2014 with the invasion um, of, uh, of Mosul by ISIS. And then, so, you know, that was a really scary time. Um, but, and we had, uh, a lot of, uh, our staff had to temporarily relocate from the embassy to other places. And I stayed there, uh, because I was in the political section, we were doing a lot of reporting. And also I was there to help relocate some of our Iraqi staff who were stuck uh, or caught, I should say, behind ISIS lines. And so it was extremely um, difficult, I think, um, for all of us who were there at the embassy, whether you were temporarily relocated or whether you were at the, at the mission. But I was also really proud. Yeah. Uh, I was really, really proud of my colleagues for being there and, you know, for all of us for... You know, not only not only because we were there trying to, you know, make sure that uh, the embassy was operational, make sure that the American citizens who were still there are safe, are safe, but also, you know, and also trying to help our colleagues stay safe. But um, 
I, I really think that these are the moments where I'm like, I'm very proud to be a foreign service officer and I'm proud to serve with these people who are foreign service officers. But were you afraid? Because I think it's part of the job description. This this times, the turbulent times that you're describing. I don't think an ISIS invasion was part of it. <laughs> It wasn't part of the job description, at least when I signed up. They may have changed it later, but uh, it was it was scary. I mean, it, it was very it was it was scary. But I think that, um, you know, and I again, I, I don't think it's just unique to me. I think this is unique. This is something that all of my colleagues share. We have a very strong sense of duty. And when you're afraid, I think when you focus on your duty to other people, I think it lessens, it tamps down the fear. Um, when I left Baghdad, you know, I called my mom and she, she was like, it's okay, it's okay, it's gonna be okay, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was, I believed her and I was like, okay. And I believed her that she was okay with the situation. And then when I left and I was in Amman and I called her, I was like, mom, I just want to let you know I left. Um, I'm outside Baghdad, I'm going back to Washington. She just started so Oh, she was relieved. She was, she was, so, she'd been so scared. She told me she hadn't slept. Um, and I was, so, I felt so horrible. But then I also, it let, it let me also feel, I was like, I'm also really like, you know, I'm grateful I was there, grateful to be part of the team, but I'm also, you know, I yeah. felt a lot of fear too. Yes. But this is the gratifying part of your job as well. I mean, Fulfilling your sense of duty is the gratifying aspect of your job. What's the most gratifying and rewarding aspect of your job, would you say? I think there's so many gratifying aspects of, of this job. Um, I think that the most gratifying aspect of this job is when someone's highest life ideals, and when we're able to meet someone's highest ideals of what America is mm -hmm. when, if that makes sense. And that makes me, because I think that, um, you know, America is not just a people, it's not just a country, it's an idea and it's a set of ideals. And so when I, I see someone who is like, so, um, It can be any, it can be a cultural project that we're working on. It can be something like, um, I don't know, something like an economic project or an event that we're doing together with a partner, like in a, in a host nation. But when I feel like this person, for me right now, like this person is seeing like the, we are living up to their ideal of what is like the best thing of America. And they are like, and I think when I see that, there's no other country. I'm sorry, I am American, so I can say this, I think. Um, I don't think that there's any other country that can really inspire that kind of feeling other than the United States. And so I, I'm, that makes me the most proud. And it makes, it makes me, I guess it's the most meaningful. These are the most meaningful moments for me. Okay. Um, if that makes sense. Yes, it, yeah. it, it makes sense by, by the story that you shared before during your, your childhood uh, years. Yes, yeah. About the gratifying part of your job that has to do with your, uh, with your childhood story. When we can bring hope, even yes. if it's just to one person, like for instance, if I'm like talking with a student, like I recently, um, I don't know, like I recently, uh, there was an event I was at and there were some students who came up to me later and uh, some of them, you know, were, I, and I had shared some of my personal story, like the one I'm sharing with you right now, they were able to relate to it in a very personal way, even though we were talking about something else. We we're talking about something more work-related, obviously, but I had thrown this in because I could feel like this was something that I, I needed to share because um, I felt like it was needed, um, not just by, not by me, but by them. So I shared it. And, um, And they noted it, and they came, and they and they said something, and and I felt like this is so meaningful for me. Then and I, because I could give them a little bit of, no, oh, that's the word I'm looking for. I made them feel hopeful, um, and just through my story. 
So that's me personally. But then on a larger level, like for instance, uh, in 2000, oh God, what year is it now? 2015, I want to say. I think it was 2015. When I was working with Ambassador Samantha Power in New York City, um, I I organized and I, I also um, helped conceptualize um, together this wonderful team, the first Security Council meeting ever on LGBT plus rights. Yes, community. Yeah. Yes, and it's has. I don't think it's. We've had one since. Actually, it was the first one, and and it was on like um, an ISIS trust, uh, ISIS um, attacks and killings of uh, of LGBT plus people in Iraq and Syria, and so and that that was like you know meaningful in a much like kind of wider broader scale but i mean and it hit all these firsts and it was it was amazing so when those kind of things happen too then you're like wow but for me like the one you know having this conversation with this one person a, a teenager about you know kind of what they're going through i guess but then but then also having this like you know being able to work on and help work on this like really important momentous event um these are the types of things like i guess you could categorize it micro macro but i don't do that it's, it's just it... no it's it's the power of sharing stories and i can tell that you're a very good storyteller because you convey emotions and i i could tell that by the by the time of the tech camp so you're you're conveying emotions to 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 your uh, people who are listening to you and that's a very important trait oh thank you i'll accept it i'll take yeah. it <laughs> So, so the episode takes place like three days before Thanksgiving. What are you doing on Thanksgiving? Ah, okay. So on Thanksgiving, this on Thanksgiving, I don't know what I'm doing. I, uh, but the day before Thanksgiving, I'm going to actually host Thanksgiving dinner. And it is with uh, some good friends of mine who are visiting from New York. Yeah. But I'm also, uh, I have a turkey that I'm getting from the American Farm School. Um, which is a wonderful partner for us here in Thessaloniki. Um, and, uh, and, but then I'm also inviting, I think I have about eight Greek friends, new Greek friends who are coming, and they've never had Thanksgiving before. So to me, this is like, this is one of my favorite things about, you know, being abroad um, in a new country is not only like all the things I'm able to experience and learn about and like, you know, um, But also, like, you know, it's the philoxenia that I receive, but it's all the philoxenia I can give. And I really, really want to, like, also just really share this really important... It's my favorite holiday. Share this holiday. Thanksgiving. Yes, I love Thanksgiving. My favorite thing about Thanksgiving is... It's not... I mean, of course, it has historical roots, like, but it's it's the... It's the going around the table and sharing one or two things that we're grateful for. And we don't do that enough. We don't practice the intentionality of gratitude enough, I think. But to be able to do this, like, together uh, in a group, it's so powerful. Um, and so I, it's, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, and pumpkin pie. Pumpkin pie is so important to me, <laughs> that with the turkey. So I don't know which one I love more. And how about Christmas? Christmas is a big holiday everywhere in the world. Yes. So how do you feel? Where, where are you spending Christmas to start I'll be with? I'll in New York. Oh, you're going. You're going. You're going to your family. No, my family is actually in in California. Okay, I'm in Seoul as well. But um, but no, I'm going to be in New York because I I have good friends there and I I love the holidays in New York also. But every Christmas is different for you. Every Christmas is different. So it happened that you have spent Christmas in the the city that you were serving. Last year I spent like the holidays in um, Thessaloniki. In Thessaloniki. And how was it? I was by myself. It was very lonely. I mean, I'll be honest with you, right? So. Uh, but last year was a uh, quarantine, yes. Yeah, it was lockdown. So I spent Thanksgiving by myself. I spent Christmas by myself. But you know, the comfort was I was like, this is a one-time thing. I'm sure this is going to be different next year. But it was hard yeah. because it's the holidays. These are the two holidays in the United States where you're. It, they're meant to be with friends and family. Thanksgiving and Christmas. Yes, but it's like the same. I think it's the same with like, you know, with Greeks. I mean, Easter is also a big holiday. You can spend it with like, you know. Yeah, but it's one. But Easter is one day. 
Nah. Christmas is like more. Okay, that's a, that's a Greek thing. <laughs> like yeah. this whole 20 days of Christmas or whatnot. I was like, how long But is Christmas? I think Greeks, we feel that Easter is, is one day because the week before is, you know, it's uh, a yeah. bit, it's a bit dark. It's sad. Yeah, no, no, it's no, all no. of this. So yeah, it's yeah, not a happy week. But Christmas is like from Christmas Eve to New Year's. It's. But there's more. Even after New Year's, yeah. until Christmas. <laughs> I was like, wow, this is, this is Christmas. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, there's more. Um, yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting because for us, you know, especially in New York, um, there's a plurality of different religions. So even though it's the holidays, we also have Hanukkah as well. And uh, there's a, a lot of Jewish Americans who live in New York also. Um, so not everyone is celebrating Christmas or if they're celebrating it, then maybe they're celebrating like the culturally in some ways um but um and then other people there's other other like holidays that people um celebrate at different times throughout the year for me i love like the i love all the rituals that go around christmas um but um but i i think that the holidays there's no place to spend the holidays for me like like new york Like New York. Yeah, New York is just something else when it comes to, like, I've December. seen it on the movies. I've never been to New York during Christmas. I've been to New really? York during uh, May uh, both Axizi. times. Definitely Axizi. Like, it, you definitely... You should go, for sure. Um, maybe Not this year, but next year, for sure. It's, yes. Yeah, and now uh, Broadway is back. So you can, like, go to all of the different... The like, theaters. The, yes, exactly. But you've never been to Thessaloniki during Christmas, Christmas. Not yet. Not yet. So the, that is an experience you need to see. Okay. I also heard in Tricola, there's a Christmas village as well that I need to go to. And also in Drama. Yes. Is that right? Yes. But okay. in Thessaloniki, during Christmas Eve and during New Year's Eve, the whole city is like a big party. It's that they're, they're grilled meats everywhere with loud music everywhere. It's for, for one time... You, you you should experience okay, it. Okay, no, no, no. I, I want to. I need. I need to. So next next winter for sure. Yes. And then there's also another. What's it? Pemtekosi. I forget. There's a. It's a. Siknopem. Siknopem. Oh, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. You have really good uh, information. It's like the same with Tiknopemdi. Okay. All right. So, yes. Grilled meat. If you're yeah. Tiknopemdi here, you will, you will get an idea okay. of how Thessaloniki is during, during Christmas. It's like a preview. Okay. It's like a preview. All right, but, got it. But it's, it's quite shocking. Even for people from Athens, it's quite shocking, Thessaloniki during Christmas. Really? Okay. In Athens, it's not like that. There's a lot of different holidays. I mean, there's also, I, I really want to also go to Naosa during, like, I think it's near Easter. Yes, there's the... Yeah, better. With yeah. the wineries and the region here. Yes, exactly. Here. Yeah. But there's, an, I think in Easter, there's a, a festival um, with masks. Okay. Yes, Yes. Um, yeah, there's so many things And there is another festival after New Year's. 6th, 7th January in Nausa, I think. Castoriane. They, they're dressed up there. It's, it's, it's interesting. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. You, you're really a good storyteller. Oh, thank why, you. Why, why? I think that's, that has to do with, with, uh, with one of our caregivers or one of our parents that... That makes someone a good storyteller. I have, I have this, this, this. You have a parent who's a good storyteller. Yes, my your, father. Your father. Yes. Okay. My mother is a good storyteller, actually. You pick it up. Yes, you do. Her stories always are a little risque, though, so I'm toning that down right now. But yes, <laughs> it's interesting if you if you if you wonder why you have certain skills. And why you're like this, why you do this as, as a job. If you weren't a diplomat, what would you be? Oh, gosh. Hmm. I would be a filmmaker. Oh, a filmmaker. Yes. I, I do love stories. And actually, I, uh, I, did, I did toy with the idea of filmmaking at one point. And I actually have a diploma in screenwriting. You know who my, my favorite filmmaker? Tell me. My, my, my absolute favorite. I mean, I was... Your 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 the the, the, the parasites. I adore ah, I adored it. Okay. I adored I do, I adored him. No, it's I think. I what's was, his name? E, e Bong. Oh God, what's his name? I'm not remembering right now either. The but. director of of the parasites. He's from from South Korea. Yes, he's from Seoul. 
Um, oh, he's, amazing. He is amazing. And he's I, amazing. I think that South Korean film in Why? General, What is happening? And, and suddenly, uh, suddenly for me, I don't know, uh, for someone else, you could say that, you know, South Korea cinema is all the rage the past 10 years. I don't know. No, I remember like uh, when I was growing up, Korean cinema was... It was all of a certain ilk. It was like everything ended in tragedy. Like I knew that if there was a dog in the beginning of the movie, the dog would be dead by the end. Like, you know, <laughs> it was like that. Like, and, uh, and, and it was very, it was different. Um, and now I feel like, you know what South Koreans do really well with their films that I, I haven't seen? They really, um, two things. One is, and I think this is why it's so interesting, Every country has, like, conflict regarding class and, like, yes. social structure. Yes? Yes. In Korea, it's very demarcated, and it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big conversation. Um, but, and I think that it's always, it's captured in almost every Korean film, that you'll, South Korean film that you'll see. I mean, yes, Parasite certainly is, makes it obvious. Yes. But even, like, the in film... In Minari. Minari. As well. Minari is, well, actually, Minari is an American film. No, it's a Korean-American film, but it's an American film. But the filmmaker is from South Korea. Mm, I don't And know. it's the, it's... I don't think so. No, no, he's Korean-American. Oh, filmmaker. really? Yeah. I think so, yeah. I need to go back and... And I'm it's his start. story. I mean, they're his, their parents. They're his parents. Yes. Yes, but he's, he's Korean-American. And then the, uh, but have you seen, it's a, mo it's a monster film. What is it called? Train to Busan? No. It's a zombie film. And basically, it's a, it's a train where, like, everyone gets infected. But it's also an allegory about social class. And, like, so it's really, like, it's just so... And about love. And about, like, how uh, parents... Uh, parental love is uh, compromised, shall we say? Okay. By, like, the by modern-day realities and needs of work and, like, you know, all of this stuff. And, but at the end, love, love wins, right? Parental one, love wins. And so it's a really, like, it's really interesting. It's really well done. And I think that this, the South Korean film industry does all of this in a really creative way. You don't see yeah. in, like, a lot of other places. And they also, even the scariest moments in the f Korean film are, uh, there's always humor. <laughs> and I don't know how it's, they build it's it like, in. It's like in Parasite. Yeah, you're like, oh, my gosh. But then it's, it's funny. It's horror and, and also... Not but it's like it's internal. It's like he builds, you know, underneath. You you watch a film like it's funny, and their poor family, they're funny. I don't know. And then suddenly he he crafts it. I don't know. He crafts the story, the shock. I don't know. He he he's amazing. Yeah. No. No. He's yeah. That's. And you study f film studies? I didn't study film studies. I studied. Uh, I mean, this was just a. This was something I did for fun after all my degrees, like. This was a, a, a degree in screenwriting, like a one-year degree that I did, like, in my spare time, uh, my copious spare time. Um, but, um, yeah, no, I, I really, I love everything about film. Um, and so that's what I would do if I could, like, uh, I guess, I don't know, have another life, perhaps. But I think that what we're talking about here, whether it's through, like, the media film are like podcasts or whether it's through from, I also write a lot of articles or write like, you know, uh, op-eds and whatnot. Um, and I do write a lot of my own remarks and, and I think that what we're talking about is stories. Yes, exactly. At the end of the day, regardless of the media. And then, so for me, that need to tell stories, whether it's through, like, you know, any of this media stays the Podcast same. Podcast films and... Yes. I, I'm a storyteller. Yes. And whether it's the story of America or whether it's the story... Some of my stories, but as a prism of American values, uh, I, I think for me it's, it's the same. And also the Security Council. This is the best stage ever. <laughs> it's like a, for highlighting in, in America, like what's important for the United States, not only like our values, but foreign policy. So, um, yeah. And like, I think that it's, it's a really, um, that I think is the most important component for me. And I think I would make the argument for any diplomat. It's we're past the age where like, you can just give wooden talking points 
and expect people to listen because you are the diplomat speaking. Exactly. You have to speak to people at where they're at. like With and, intimacy. With intimacy. And vulnerability. And understanding. Yes. yes. Vulnerability, understanding. And if you don't do that, you've lost your audience even before you, you, exactly, you open your mouth. Exactly. And new generations are more are more um, aware, are more conscious. I mean, it's not there's the the council speaking and whatever she says. No, you need to, yeah. to, to, to connect with them. And, you know, I don't even want people to listen to me because of that. To me, that would seem like such an inauthentic connection. I would hate that, actually. I yes. want people to listen to me because what I say is actually speaking to them. And if it's not there... And they're just, they're there. And resonates with and them. And resonates with them. And yes. also not just that, but I'm giving something that's useful. Yes. And so without that, I don't even like, to me, it's, it's not really worthwhile. I mean, for me also. Yes. Um, so even if I'm talk giving talking points about something that might be a very, what you would consider a dry issue, I try to tailor it so that it's something that is still, I'm still able to connect in some kind of authentic way with yes, the audience. Exactly. That, 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 exactly what you did with us in September with a tech camp uh, project. Oh, well. Yes, I know. I was there. We were crying. <laughs> <laughs> so in the end, you want to add, to add something more? No, I just, I really want to thank you. Like, no, for, I want to thank no, you. No, 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 <laughs> for, for inviting me here today. And I think that, You know, I think that what's really important is to have more of, like, in the world in general, but I would say in Greece as well, is, is to have more authentic voices, especially women's voices. And so I know that you you host and you speak with, like, a, a large, like a, diff, like, a variety of people, not just women. Yes. But you speak with them in your own voice, and you speak with them through your own authentic, like, platform and your views and i i think this is so important so really i, I want to thank you for <laughs> i thank you that's why that's why my listeners listen to this show because of the approaches like that it's it's authenticity it's no scripted it's we we need to connect i have to connect with my guest in order for my audience to connect with us as well yeah and i i think that's really that's important because i mean they're so you would think that the number of people that we meet every day that we're making like dozens of connections daily it's not the case you really have to make an incision into like the fabric of the ordinary and i think that what you're doing here does that so oh, i thank you so much a, a last question yes yes i i want you to recommend a less popular destination based on your travel oh and and Uh, For us, but but a, but a not popular destination, you know, a, a really. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I, I think. Let me give me one second. I mean, everyone says hakibiki, right? Something hakibiki the nehi, but but not only in Greece. Ah, oh no, so one in Greece and one outside. Oh, you're changing parameters of the question. Okay, fine. So I think okay, one of my favorite places, and this is totally like. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. So my second year of my first assignment, um, which was in Seoul, South Korea, I, I randomly took this, assign uh, this short-term assignment um, that popped up. Like, and um, it was in Laos, in Vientiane, Laos. And I had never been there. I knew very little about it. So I had no idea what to expect. And which, in retrospect, was the best thing ever. Because I arrived and it was just this, the most... Yours to discover it. Yes, it was the most special place. I love, loved and love, like, Laos. Um, okay. It was familiar and yet unfamiliar. It's right next to Cambodia, also adjacent to uh, um, Thailand and Vietnam. And so it's just... But it's just... And it's also a former French colony. And it has this mescla of, like, different different flavors and... And just influences, but it's just completely its own thing. I, I would highly recommend. Okay. Yeah. Um, so there's, it's just a beautiful, beautiful country. Um, and, uh, and then I guess like within, within Greece, I have to choose something. And I feel like all of Northern Greece, actually, because, and one place I really, uh, I know that 
maybe some of your listeners are from there or they they know about it so for them, maybe them it's just kind of old hat but i really really love xanthi oh xanthi i've never been to xanthi really then you can benefit from yes yeah. from this too so xanthi yatioki yatioki they they give even xanthi so something you need to correct so xanthi for me is it's it's just this really this historical gem and with the old town i've seen pictures it's just and but listen it's not just the old town it's like because you have to be there around 11 p.m. or midnight because that is when the juxtaposition is clear oh my and, god inside information yes and because you have the democratic like, university right there like right in the heart almost of old town and then you have the old town which is is beautiful and it's it is old So you have this like these really ancient or old bones and you have this river flowing through which also has this mythology of like Heracles and like yeah. the seven like wild horses or I forget the number of horses the man eating horses that were that were there uh, as part of his trials. So you have this like ancient history you have like these really like old tobacco owners homes and so you have this like really old piece of history but then like at midnight is when all the students come out Okay, okay then, I'm I'm convinced. <laughs> so then you have I, I have this theory that you learn more about a city from a visitor than from a local. Hmm. In some I mean when I was living in Barcelona because I really wanted to be in the the right places I was uh, looking for information I was I yeah. was asking people so if you could ask me back then I could tell you the the, the best places to go in Barcelona more than a local. But you know why? Because a local, like if you were to ask me, like let's say I'm, I don't know, I'm not a local. I guess I'm not a local here yet. I don't know if I, uh, I'll have the chance to become one. Uh, although I, I, but I think that uh, it's here a, for them. It's 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 or the ordinary for them. A local is a photograph. They're part of the photograph. A visitor is the camera. Yeah. Really old here. Storyteller, I mean, <laughs> yes, a visitor is a camera. Yes. I love this phrase. You can take it. It's yours. <laughs> I will give I you the credit. No, you don't have to. I will give you to. the credit. My, my listeners know I give, always give the credits. Uh, no, he needs us. The visitor is the camera, yes. Yes, the visitor is the camera. Too often, not all locals, because locals, some locals can still capture and retain that sense of wonderment. Yes. But more often than not, they, we become... part of the photograph part of the story yes. yes yes instead of writing the story and like you know reading it so it's different Elizabeth said okay go <laughs> uh, uh, but thank you so much this has been really really lovely um, I thank you yeah yes as much as I could say thank you